with the exterior of the RV home base structure now raised, it was now time for Cheryl and I to get busy roughing in the living quarters. Welcome to RV Life in Three Quarter Time, a vlog covering our adoption of the RV lifestyle. We are Cheryl and Carl Pearson, and here we're documenting the transition from our current lifestyle to our chosen adaptation of RV life, and hopefully passing along some useful information as we go. As I said in an earlier video, uh, the current house that we live in, we put in probably 95% of the labor on the build. With this current home, with the metal structure and 30 something years of age on our frames, we're not doing nearly as much of the work ourselves. But one of the places where we're putting in a good bit of our own labor is roughing in and laying out the living quarters, the interior of the home. We decided we didn't want to just lay flooring on top of a concrete slab, so we're putting in a subfloor and some insulation over the slab. And we're studding up the walls with metal studs in keeping in with the theme that the, the house is metal frame to begin with. And really the current price of wood makes the price of putting up metal studs um, probably comparable. And I just wanted to see how it worked. So, let's see how the build progressed. A heavy truck such as the dually we use to pull our fifth wheel and a utility trailer are handy things to have when procuring construction materials. Here we're bringing in OSB panels for the subfloor in the RV home base living quarters. In the subfloor between the concrete slab and the OSB panels, we laid down a layer of Dow 1 inch foam insulation panels. The truck and trailer also came in handy when procuring the framing materials for the living quarter walls. We used metal stud framing for the interior walls. There were supply shortages at the time and we had to search around for a while before finally finding a vendor in Macon, Georgia that could supply our needs. Before laying down the subfloor, we laid out the interior walls using 2x4s, utilizing this hammer-activated nail tool. This tool uses a 22 caliber load to drive the nail through the 2x4 and into the concrete slab below. A measuring tape, a marker, a straight edge, and a utility blade were all we needed to get the foam insulation into place. We had carpet seam tape available, so we used that to tape the seams. Because we were lifting the level of the floor by putting in the subfloor, I realized we'd have to lift the doors an inch and a half in order to clear the flooring. Luckily, this was easy enough to do with the steel framing. In order to make the mini straight cuts in the OSB, I fashioned this work table around my old table saw. This allowed us to use a straight 2x4 and a couple of clamps to fashion a straight edge. And while it took two of us to handle the wood safely, it made cutting the OSB rather simple. We reached our next hurdle in a heavy, windy rainstorm in mid-June. While we had experienced light to moderate rains with no problem, at this point we discovered that there was significant leakage at the point where the monitor barn's lean-tos met the uh, center section. This resulted in a fair amount of water dripping down the metal wall which would serve as one of the interior walls in our living space. This forced us to take up much of the uh, OSB that we already had down near the wall in order to avoid water damage. We called the guys at Metal Pros and they got it fixed, but it took several trips to pin down the exact problem. Turns out there was a problem with not sealing the top edge of this piece of flashing, and once that was corrected, then the leak stopped. 
this setback pushed our getting our subfloor finished well into July. When July 4th arrived, one of our neighbors, I'm not sure which, in a field behind the trees across the road from our property, put on a firework display. This display lasted well over 25 minutes, and it was well worth the time it took for us to just sit back and enjoy the show. While waiting for our leak problem to be remedied, we were still making progress. We sold a house that we had bought and refurbished after the last real estate crash, and now the market was hot enough that it sold for more than we expected, so we decided that uh, we could now afford to have our gravel driveways paved. We looked around and found a contractor that could do the job at a price that we could afford, and these guys got out there and got the job done in short order. The home we had sold was where we had been storing our Coachman Brookstone fifth wheel, so we had to tow the fifth wheel out to the RV home base property, park it out of the way of the driveway work, and wait for the time when we will be finished and ready to pull it into the RV home base garage. Looking at the gravel base for the ramp up to the RV home base garage, I realized that water was going to run off the driveway and collect right in front of the door to our front porch. So we were going to need to install some sort of drainage. We bought three of these five foot drainage kit sections from the big orange home supply store in order to handle our drainage requirements. The kit is heavy plastic with a sturdy metal grate and offers various options for draining the water once collected, including a punch out on the bottom and various fittings that can be attached to the end of the channel. We decided to use the punch out on the bottom for the, our drainage pipe, so this blank channel stop was the option that we chose. With our drainage hardware selected, it was now time to dig the ditch into which the channel would be placed. Since we opted to bring the water out of the bottom of the channel, a deeper trench was needed in which to place the black drainage pipe that would take the water away from the collection site. We fit the three sections together, put the blank stops on each end, and attached this elbow to attach to the drainage pipe. The drainage pipe was a standard black with uh, holes, perforations in the bottom half so water could seep out all along the length of the pipe. To keep dirt from getting into the pipe itself, we attached this drainage sleeve. And finally, we're ready to set the channel into place. We put the channel in place, added enough dirt to make sure there was enough slope that the water drained correctly. Then, once everything was in place, backfilled and covered everything, and now we were ready for the driveway to go into place. We were quite happy with the way the driveways turned out. As you can see here, our lawnmower had broken down for the third time this summer, and the 
yard was starting to get out of control. And yes, we pay both driveways, both the one to bring the fifth wheel in and the one to take it out. Now dried in, we needed to finish the subfloor before getting the walls up. First by replacing the foam board and the first layer of OSB that we had taken up, and then by installing a second layer of OSB. Also needed to move the steel framing material from inside the living quarters area out into the garage since now we finally had our garage doors in place and could lock the materials up there. The first layer of OSB was cut to run perpendicular to the length of the living area, so we cut the second layer of OSB to run parallel to the length of the living area in order to make the floor stronger. Once we had cut and fit a second layer panel and was ready to secure it to the floor, we used a heavy-duty construction adhesive from a caulk gun to the back of the panel and then liberally applied 7 8 inch screws to secure it to the first level. With the subfloor finally in place, we were ready to get furring strips on the ceiling and the walls into place. By now it was August, and August in the southeast is hot and humid, so we had every fan we could find running and we drank a lot of water during this process. It was fairly easy getting the furring strips into place using the 10 and 12 foot step ladder. We attached a five gallon bucket to the ladder to hold tools we needed to get the hat channel furring strips in place. Even though we were using self-tapping screws, it was much easier to drill a pilot hole in the heavy 11 gauge metal of the ceiling beams. Installing the hat channel furring strips was definitely a two-person job. Once in place, we used gear ties to secure the hat channel while screwing the channel to the beams. We began using our metal channel and studs to stud up the interior walls, 16 inch on center, upon which we would hang sheetrock. We began with the inside of the exterior walls because we knew they should be square. Since the existing framework was made from two by three rectangular steel members, we had to use two and a half inch channel and studs to frame up the walls for the sheetrock. We simply had to align it with the interior edge of the existing framing members. We put in wooden headers to attach hardware for doors or windows, and in this case to mount the interior head of one of the mini splits. Since the walls were tall, we used a 22 gauge stud and channel rather than the normal 25 gauge you would find at a big box store like Home Depot. Working with metal studs is a lot like working with the old erector set, except you connect things with the screws instead of a nut and bolt. We measured things in the normal manner. Uh, you essentially marked everything with a sharpie and then cut things with a pair of tin snips, aviation snips, some people call them, uh, rather than using the straight inline type snips, we found that using the snips with the curve to the left or the right made cutting these studs easier. When moving the metal in quantity around from area to area, we always use gloves, but I found that when cutting and manipulating the 
materials, it was much easier to work without a glove and just take your time and be careful. Once we got a rhythm, things moved quickly. I found that if I measured and marked things and Cheryl measured and cut the studs, that things went up quickly. It took us a little over two days to get the exterior wall studs and headers into place. And we were ready to get the other walls in place with the three and five eighths inch channel and stud. Here, using a laser level, I've just framed up and squared the channels for the first wall. This digital laser measuring tape came in very handy. Since a lot of the interior walls go up to a sloped ceiling, so each stud will have a different measure. First, I set the options to measure from the back of the unit, then set the unit down into the floor channel, point the laser up to the ceiling channel, and take the measure. The measurement made, I would use a sharpie to mark the lengths in the approximate location where the stud would go on the floor, and Cheryl would mark each stud that she cut with the length to which it had been cut so we could match things up. Using those squaring and measuring methods, a battery-powered drill, and short, self-tapping, flat-headed metal screws, it wasn't long before we had all the interior walls in place and we were ready to call back out the electricians and plumbers so they could finish their work in the living quarters of the RV home base. Well, there it is. Delay, delay, delay. But finally, the interior is roughed in and we can call in contractors to move the project forward. Have you experienced construction delays? Just how frustrating did you find them? Please comment below and share your experiences. That's it for this episode of RV Life in Three Quarter Time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please click the like button. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Click the notification bell. Sorry it took so long to get this episode out. We've had some family issues which have interfered with our YouTube production and getting the RV home base done. Hopefully we're working past those issues and we'll uh, be getting back on schedule. Our next episode will cover the final work of contractors on the RV home base. So, until then, as always, get out there and enjoy the ride.